Oh, family tension. Yeah, 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 yeah. Family tension. Man, it can happen in a heartbeat, can't it? Boy, everything can be going great. Everything's wonderful. Everybody's happy about everything. You're going out to eat. All of a sudden, somebody says something. Somebody that heard it didn't receive it well. And then they had something else to say. And then somebody else was silent the whole time. And by the time you get to the restaurant, you're having Mike the Royal Rumble or the Smackdown or whatever you, you know, whatever you want to call it, MMA. I mean, it can just happen in a heartbeat. Somebody can say one sentence, you know, or have one possession that somebody else doesn't have. Or, you know, have one... Uh, dream or drive that's <laughs> different and express it and boom, all of a sudden, what was a loving, great, you know, wonderful family, close and everything can be just messed up. And some of this stuff you, you, you almost never get over, right? Yeah, I mean, some of you still having trouble getting over some stuff that you've had happen in your family, right? Somebody said something to you. Why would they say something like that? Now, they didn't bit more mean it than a man in the moon. That was one of our old saying. You know, they didn't mean it any more than a man in the moon. But they said it. And when they said it, boy, it just sent strife through the family just like an electric shock. And it's hard to get over, um, especially if, you know, if you don't handle this in the right way. So I want to I share with you, that God created us. God knows us. God made us. And he made us with certain properties and certain personalities and propensities, and, 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 and he just he made us in certain ways. And there are certain elements that are true about all of us. Uh, some may have a little more than others, and in some it may be deeper in some areas than others. But, but basically at our core, you know, God created us, male and female created he them in his image, and we all have certain things that are just... Uh, universally the same in our lives. And this thing of tension and strife is, a, is a, a lesson that the Lord teaches us a lot about in his word. Some great uh, examples of how tension happens, what to, what to pay attention to, what to look to uh, as uh, potential uh, problems in a family so that you can begin to strategize about it and begin to see it and begin to address it. Because let me just tell you something, it's not going away by itself. Uh, your tension in your family is not going to just all of a sudden automatically disappear. Especially nowadays, I mean, it was bad enough when most families were made up of, of a mom and a dad and their children. Nowadays, it's made up of mom's children, dad's children, and their children, you know, or some mixture of all of that. And then you have uh, other uh, situations that are mixed in, and, and things can just get all, you know, out of whack in a real hurry uh, because we don't pay attention to what's happening in our life. And when tension comes into a family, nobody wants to be there. You don't want to go home. <laughs> You don't want to be around home. You're looking for a reason to go away. You're trying to get out of there. So when tension is in a home, nobody wants to be there. But when patience and love, when God's design is in a home, boy, everybody wants to be there. Let's go over to you know, their house. That's a wonderful place. I love it over there. You're, you're sensing the lack of tension. You know, you're tension. There's no drama going on in there. And, of course, we have family members, God help them, that are drama queens, and they love drama. <laughs> They're usually teenagers. Uh, they love drama. I mean, everything that happens in a teenager's life happens what I call teen-sized. Uh, either extremely great or extremely bad, one or the other. There's really very little in the middle. It's either... Whoa, this is the greatest thing that ever happened, and I'm so pumped about it and juiced it. I'm, or this is the sorriest thing. I don't want to do that. I mean, one extreme or the other, but it's drama. It's drama. Look at your neighbor and say drama. Okay, all right. So what is it that causes family tension? If it's so easy to get started, I'm, I've, you may notice in your notes I've used the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, and I just did this because I wanted you to see that from the very start, things have, have been this way. I mean, barely had there been a family on this earth when the first tension started happening in the family. 
You know, God creates Adam and Eve, and they begin to have, a, they begin to have their children. And the Bible begins to tell us, like, in about the fourth chapter. I mean, it's, the book has barely begun. Humanity has barely begun. Uh, the first generation of people are on this earth, and they got, they got strife and tension going on in the family. And you remember what it was about, right? Cain and Abel, the two boys. Cain was born first. Abel was born second. They had some sisters and so forth and some other family children, but uh, they were the oldest. And, and of course, uh, the point, the issue was God wanted a sacrifice. And so uh, Cain was a worker of the fields, a uh, vegetable farmer, and Cain said, I'll give God my vegetables and, and my best vegetables, and I'll give him the best that I have, and I'll, I'll, he'll be pleased with the best vegetables that I have, and he'll honor my offering, and it'll be wonderful. And then Abel was a tender of the flocks. He had sheep and cattle and goats and all of that. And so Abel said, well, I'm going to give him the best sacrifice of my flocks, and I'm going to shed the innocent blood to cover the sins of the guilty, which is what God wants, by the way. And so God honored Abel's offering and accepted it, and was pleased with it, but Cain's offering, he didn't accept, and he refused it, and Cain got jealous, and Cain got outraged, and, he, and, it, and it was such a, a, a rivalry. Let me put it up here first, because you want sibling, sibling rivalry in that first blank. It was such a rivalry in the family that Cain, the older brother, took a rock, and hit his brother Abel in the head and killed him right there in the field. Jealousy and strife and anger can become so hostile so quick. That's why there's so many divorces and so many families in trouble and so much uh, leaving going on and abandonment and all of those kind of things because uh, we all have a way. And we all want our way. We think our way is the best way. We think that we should be the favored one. Let me, let me just give you one little insight, parents. I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't really know whether I did it or not. I hope I did it. I think I did it, but I might not have. So anyway, I'm praying for you so you'll know how to do it, okay? But every one of your children should believe that they are the favorite. Honestly. When you say something about, well, you know, uh, we know that, uh, no, we got, you know, you can fix it because uh, you're the, boy, you're, you, you, you've got it going on. Every child in your family needs to believe you're talking about them. If there, are, if there are three of them or 10 of them or two of them or whatever, they all should be sitting there going, I know dad's talking about me because <laughs> I'm really the favorite, I tell you. He just loves me and, you yeah. Every one of them should feel that way. You should, you should live there. In other words, in, in the nature of your family, your chill, you can't pick favorites. It's, you know, I'm just telling you, you just, it causes rivalry in your family. I'll just give you another example out of the book of Genesis. Here's another one. Uh, Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob were born, they were in the womb, and they were fighting inside the womb of their mother. They were fighting for who's going to be the greatest, who's going to be first. Who, and, and, of course, Esau, uh, uh, Esau was born first, and Jacob was born actually grabbing on to the heel of Esau. I mean, when they were birthed, little, <laughs> little, little infant Jacob had his hand wrapped around the heel of his brother that was born as if to say, I'm not letting you get ahead of me in anything. And, and their whole life was about competition with each other. Because sibling rivalry is a competition. It's not just uh, who's the best and who's favored. And I, I mean, this is competition, man. This is like, I've got to prove. I've got something to prove. And you're going to go my way. And the family's going to follow me. And then we're going to have all. And, and, and with, with Esau and Jacob, it was that way their whole life. As a matter of fact, did, did I put a verse in here? No, I didn't. Uh, I'll have one in, in a while. But anyway, the, so the first cause of tension and strife in your family will be sibling rivalry. 
Watch for sibling rivalry. I know you're looking at them and they look like little angels and you're thinking they just love each other so much. They're just so close and tight. And you know, Listen, Tanya and I had our children. Justin and Amy are, what, 16 months apart, roughly? 16 and a half, excuse me. 16 and a half months apart. We did that on purpose. You know why? Because we wanted our children to grow up together. We wanted them to have the same... Uh, peer group and the same people, you know, and be able to be in the same groups of people and enjoy each other. And, and our ulterior motive was that they would rat each other out. That, you know, that would really, we were thinking, see, this just shows you how naive we were. We were young, you know, we, uh, we thought that when they got to be teenagers that we could ask Amy, you know, something about what's going on with Justin, and she would tell us, and then we would ask <laughs> Justin something about Amy, and he would tell us, and I'm telling you, buddy, they have master clearance with each other. I mean, you cannot get, you could not torture a word out of them toward each other. It is unbelievable how quiet they were about what was going on with each other. And even in those kind of situations, you'll see sibling rivalry. You'll see one of them, something doesn't happen. Uh, you'll see you put down a couple of glasses of juice on the table at supper time, and I guarantee you that one of those kids is looking at that glass and saying, do I have as much as he does? <laughs> rivalry, baby. I mean, who's number one? We all seem to be passionate about being number one. Even if it really doesn't matter, we still want to be number one. God just kind of put in us a drive for uh, superiority, you know? And we're driven that way, and our natures are that way, and, and families are that way. And so watch your family because that will be one of the issues that go on and somehow, if you can convince them that they're all super special and that you love them more than anybody, all the rest of them, just convince every one of them of that, and, and you'll be good. All right, second thing. Uh-oh. How did that get past that? Isaac, did you do that? Second thing. You got to watch Isaac. He'll mess you. Um, second one, second cause of, of, of strife would be material possessions. Um, and I'm going to use Abraham and Lot, and I know you know the story, most of you that have been in the Bible very long. And I just got a couple of verses here. There are obviously bunches of verses that come. The first six verses that come before seven and eight are talking to you about this land that they came to. You know, God called Abram out of the land of Ur and sent him to a promised land, made a big covenant, gave him seven things in that covenant about being blessed and all the nations of the earth, and your, you know, your, your, your lineage will be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky and all that kind of stuff. And they got to a place in Egypt, and then, you know, Abram got, uh, Pharaoh liked Sarah, Abram's wife. Now, she's about uh, 75 years old at, at, or so, roughly, right in there. And she's such, still such a good-looking woman and so striking that Abram is afraid that Pharaoh is going to kill him and take his wife. So he says, she's my sister. You, you, remember, you remember this story? So Pharaoh starts kind of, you know... Um, tinker around and, and, and trying to, you know, quarter and this, that, and the way, the way pharaohs would do. I don't know how they do. But anyway, uh, uh, he, he happened to see one day out the palace window, he was looking down into the park, and he saw Abram and Sarah sitting side by side, and whatever they were doing, uh, it, it told him, uh, that's not brother and sister. And so he came to Abram, he said, I thought you said she was your sister. He said, yeah, so she's my sister. He said, you don't do that with your sister. And so you've brought a curse on me, he said. Get out of here, you and all your flock. And, all that. and they ran them out of Egypt. And when they ran, they ran to a place near Sodom and Gomorrah. There were plains down there, you know, just uh, beautiful grass and sceneries and, and the mountains. And it was gorgeous all around. And Abraham looks at Lot. Now, here's what happened. So an argument broke out between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot. And at that time, Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land. Then Abram talked it over with Lot. This arguing between our herdsmen has got to stop, he said. After all, we're close relatives. And, and I, I put that scripture so that you can see that even among relatives, material things can cause problems. As a matter of fact, when you don't have anything, <laughs> you are probably as tight as you can possibly be. I mean, everybody's joined in together because you're poor as Job's turkey. You know, you have nothing. 
And so there's nothing to be upset about. There's nothing to argue about. There's nothing to be envious about. Like somebody got something you don't have or they got more or you wish you had not what they had. No, 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 no. Man, when you are poor and you're struggling and your family is being attacked or under fire or whatever it might be and you've lost your job and you're trying to make it and you're picking up Coke bottles on the side of the road and life is tight and tough and th man, the family is just boom, just knit together. But I'm going to tell you something, nothing will test your family like prosperity. If you don't believe it, you just get a little something. Or here's something, here's something easier to see. Let somebody die in the family that has something and then see what happens with the rest of the family about who's going to get what. I, she told me I could have her wedding ring and I can't even find it. And you must have put it up. So I know you got it. Where did you hide that thing? And mama said, I got the dresser and that dresser's not even in there anymore. You, where did you put that dresser? That's mine. You know, I mean, it's just unbelievable what kind of strife and what kind of uh, issues happen over material things in life because we want the possessions. <laughs> you know, we want what we want when we want it, and we believe that we have the right to have it. And so, um, you know, those kind of things are, are problems. And so, uh, if you want your family to be tight, just be broke. Uh, that's pretty much all I can say. And uh, if, you got, if you have anything, uh, watch out. You know, if you start having anything, if you start, you know, like you can pay for them to go to camp or you can uh, get them a new pair of tennis shoes or, you know, whatever it is that you can give one and not give all of them, uh, you got potential tension <laughs> coming up right there, baby. You got to, I'm just saying you can do it because obviously we didn't give Amy everything we gave Justin nor Justin everything we gave Amy. Matter of fact, we did it on purpose sometime, you know, just to, just to, just to get it out, you know. And, and make them, make them kind of display a little bit of that so we could preach to them about it and tell them how that ain't happening, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. But you got to plan. I'm just saying, plan. you got to plan and strategize because it is going to be a problem. Just write it down. It's a problem. All right, here's the third thing, favoritism. <clears throat> favoritism causes tension in the family. Now, that's not hard to understand, right? Because favoritism causes tension anywhere. As a matter of fact, in this church, uh, if I asked you to raise your hand, I, I would hope that everybody in here could raise their hand and say, I'm pastor's favorite member. I'm the favorite member of this church, pastor. My, he loves me. He loves me. Because I, I want you to feel that way. Because you are. You say, who's your favorite? Uh, the one I'm hugging at the moment. That's the one. Because I love all of you. And, and see, in a family, uh, your family needs to feel that that there's not one that you like and one that mom likes or vice versa or one that is the smartest or everybody in the family knows they, they're the smartest and so they can't do anything wrong and then the rest of them are just little dunces that go, you know, and they feel that. And when they feel it, it causes tension in the family, man. And especially, I mean, imagine it, especially if you have yours, mine, and ours. I mean, imagine how that could become, you know, how that strife could become such tremendous tension and so forth, because usually you have some that are the same age, you know, and, and then, oh my goodness, it's, it's really in the same sex and same age, and it's like, it's like you know, who's the favorite? Who's going to be the battle royal? Here, here's, a, here's a family. Uh, this, is, this is Esau and Jacob, but just, I just want you to see what, what the Bible says. Isaac loved Esau, Isaac's dad. Dad loved Esau in particular because of the wild game he brought home. In other words, Esau was, Esau means red, hairy one. And so uh, here's this big red, hairy brood of a man who goes out hunting in the woods and kills the, the game, brings it home, uh, skins it, does it, cleans it, puts it on, makes the soup or the barbecue or whatever it is, brings it to dad and goes, there you go, dad, have all of it. And dad said, whoa, boy, you are the greatest, you know. And everybody knew in the family, everybody knew that Isaac, loved Esau. And look at this. But Rebekah, who is mom, uh, favored Jacob. So here you have a classic example of, of family tension because one parent loves one child the most and the other parent loves the other child the most. Can I say to you, just simply, and I know that I don't even need to say this to you because it's just completely ob obvious, 
Parents, you cannot play favorites in your family. You cannot allow your children to believe that one of them is favored above the others. Because if you do, you're not going to have any peace in your home. There's always going to be strife. There's always going to be contention. Let me, let me just bring this to your attention. Uh, Jacob here is favored by mom, you know, and, and she does everything she can to help him get ahead in life. Well, later on in his life, this just kind of shows you how this stuff just snowballs as it goes along. Later on in life, Jacob is, uh, is with his brothers. And at this time, he has uh, whew, about 10 brothers. Uh, Benjamin's not there yet, the baby, but everybody else is there. All the other 12 tribes of Israel are there, of which he's one. You knew this. Uh, he, he, Jacob uh, loves one of his sons, Joseph, more than all the rest of them. And he makes Joseph this coat of many colors to say to Joseph, you are my favorite child. You are so awesome. I, man, if, any, if God does anything with anybody in this family, it's going to be you, son, because you are the greatest. And the other brothers receive this. Now, to make matters worse, Joseph has already been talking about some dreams that he had. He had a dream that there were like sheaves of corn, you know, like leaves, like, like shucks of, of corn standing up. And then there was one, one out here that was looking back at these other 11 that were standing up. And all of a sudden, the 11 shucks bowed down, sheaves bowed down to that one. And Joseph said, man, I got to tell my brothers, this is the most amazing dream that anybody's ever had in the whole wide world. And he went out there and he just said, guys, hey, look, I had this dream last night and you were the 11 sheaves and I was the one sheep and you bowed down to me like I was the king. Man, isn't that a hoot? Oh goodness, man, that was a dream. And then the next night, he had another dream. He said he saw the sun, the moon, and the stars all bowing down to him. And he went out and he said, guys, hey, this is the greatest dream. You know, I had that one last night. I had another one tonight. This was the sun, the moon, and the stars all bowed down to me. I don't know what it means. but I'm a... And then you put that with the coat of many colors that dad's already given him to show that he's the greatest. And you know what happened to Joseph? They took Joseph. They knocked him in the head. They threw him down in a pit. And when the Midianites came by, they sold him as a slave to the Midianites. And they took his coat off, and they poured animal blood on it, and they took it back to dad and told him an animal killed Joseph. Yeah, 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 siblings, siblings, favoritism. They got to cause a little tension, a little strife in the family. Let me give you another one. This is the last one I'm going to just point out to you. Uh, rebellion. Rebellion. When you have children that rebel, uh, that basically force you to... Uh, uh, come to the conclusion that, that they, they're going to do their own thing and they're not going to follow the family and they're going to not obey the rules and they're going to be different and everybody else is going to have to uh, adjust to them and so forth. This causes real strife and real tension in a family. Let me just show you one here. This is Esau. You know, you remember Rebecca loved Jacob and, and Isaac loved Esau. Well, Esau got mad because of the birthright and all that. You know, I've preached about all that and, you, and, and we'll do it again. But, but, uh, but here's what Esau did. He rebelled. Well, look, look. At the age of 40, Esau married a young woman named Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite. He also married, and the way you pronounce that is, is Basmoth. He also married Basmoth. You know what Basmoth means? It means spice. It means he married a spicy woman. One of the Spice Girls. That would date me, doesn't it? <laughs> Forgive me. So Esau marries one of the Spice Girls and, and the daughter of Elon the Hittite, but Esau's wives made life miserable for Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, but you know why? Because they were heathens. Because they, the, all the Israelites were commanded not to marry anybody outside of their family uh, group, outside the Jewish race. They were not to marry a Hittite or a Canaanite or a Perizzite or a Termite or a Cellulite or, a, you know, I mean, you, you marry, you marry, 
within the within the within the culture of Judaism. That's who you marry. But he, I saw Esau says, "Man, no, I'm not paying attention. I don't have to follow those rules. Ain't nobody telling me what to do. So I'm going to make everybody else adjust to what I want." And so he brings these two wives back home with him, and it causes fits for his for his mom and dad for the rest of their life, because Esau is now forcing the family. He's forcing the family to have to accept what he wants over what the rules really are like. That causes tension. How would you like to be at their home on Thanksgiving dinner? No, no. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? What can we do about it? If these are the causes of, uh, of strife and tension in a home, and they are, and there, there are probably some breakdowns of all of those. Could, you could get a little more intricate than all that, but, but, but that's enough. Those happen every day in families. How do you, what do you do about it? How do you deal with it? Number one, now we're going to the book of James. All these scriptures from now on will be out of the book of James. Does everybody have their steel-toed shoes on? You got them? Because James is going to step on your feet and your toes. He will. Don't read the book of James if you don't want to be mashed a little bit because he's very straightforward about what he says. And every one of these are going to be out of the book of James. Number one, control the tongue. Control your tongue, the words that you talk. One of the biggest offenders in our families is this little four-inch, roughly four-inch uh, appendage here that is, uh, that is tied into the back of our mouth that seems to wag <laughs> at any moment, you know. A loose tongue is a very offensive. I mean, the words you say is what I'm trying to say to you. If you're gonna if you're gonna pull out of the tension and the strife that is around in family, you're gonna have to be careful when you speak words because words that are spoken in anger or frustration uh, are picked up on. And let me also mention to you this: that 65 percent of communication is nonverbal which means it may not even be something you say. It can be the way you look. It can be your countenance. It can be your, uh, you, you roll your eyes. Uh, you look up and shake your head. Uh, uh, I mean, what are you, you, you speak without saying a word, but, but especially the words that you say, you got to be careful what you say because when you're frustrated, when you're angry, you will say things that you really don't mean. And then, and, and you will be shocked, I promise you, you will be shocked when they tell you what you said. And you'll be saying to yourself, I know I didn't say that because I would never say anything like that. And unless they have a recording, which nowadays most people will have, uh, and you'll be on YouTube being, uh, you know, you'll be, what, what do they call that? Uh, uh, you'll become viral uh, with your rant. By the, by, the time, by the time you even know it, they say, well, look on YouTube. You're on there. You went viral. Yeah, 14 million hits right there, you know. Watching somebody blow up at their sibling and say mean, evil things and wicked things. And, and, and when you hear yourself saying these things, you're going to be so embarrassed. You're going to be so taken back by this because you will be shocked what you can say when you get so angry that you just blurt out stuff. I know you've seen this. I know you've been disappointed in yourself, right? You've said words you said you'd never say. You've thought thoughts. You, if you didn't say it, you thought about it. You know, you're looking around saying, man, something ought to be said. You know? <laughs> man, I need a lost friend to come up here. Can you say this for me? Because I'm, I, I'm Christian. I can't talk like that. But, you know, yeah. So your words are ex ex extremely important. Now, let me show you what James has to say about this. We all make many mistakes. This is in chapter 3. But those who control their tongues can also control themselves in every other way. What is James saying? That the most difficult thing in your life to control is your tongue. It's not your sex drive. It's not your greed. It's not, it, it, it's not your selfishness. It's your tongue. Your tongue is the will get out of control in a minute. And now watch what it says. We can make a large horse turn around and go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And you know this is true. 
and a tiny rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. Man, the winds might even be blowing against it, but that little tiny rudder, now the rudder's tiny in comparison with the size of the ship is what it is, and, and, and it, but it, yet it makes that ship go right where the captain wants it to go. So also the tongue is a small thing. Yes, it is, but what enormous damage it can do. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. It doesn't, you don't have to have a blazing inferno to set a fire. A little tiny spark, boom, one little tiny word, boom, one little tiny communication, boom. And all of a sudden, you've got a peaceful situation that blows completely up. And if you keep talking, it's like pouring gas on the situation. And the, look, look, look at what he says now. This is the word of God, remember, all right? This is not my thoughts about things right here. This is God saying, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction, for it is set on fire by hell itself. <laughs> That's why God has to bathe it in this liquid in here, you know? And, and, and hide it behind these ivory bars. I mean, you know, it's got to stay trapped because it's set on fire of hell. My goodness, that means the devil is the one who has more control if, you, if you're not careful with your tongue. People can tame all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is an uncontrollable evil full of deadly poison. Good night. Look at what the tongue's compared to. A blazing inferno, uh, an unruly evil, and, uh, and deadly poison. <laughs> I mean, what a comparison for the tongue. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father when you come to church on Sunday, when you sit here and sing praise and worship. Look, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it breaks out into curses. That's when you go home. That's when, that's, that's when you walk out on the parking lot and you come to the first four-way stop and somebody butts in line uh, right there. Or you stand in line in the restaurant and the Presbyterians and Methodists are just got you packed out on say, All right. Uh, and sometimes it breaks out into curses against those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. See, this is the tongue. If you're going to remove tension from your family, you're going to have to watch the words that come out of your mouth. And watch what your body says to them when you're talking to them or talking to others. I mean, look, parenting is a difficult thing. And I'm not just talking about the kids. You can do it with each other, right? <laughs> Mom and dad and their relationship with each other. Man, you just, how do you listen? How do you listen? Well, let me, let me say this to you first. James also has a prescription for how to get your tongue under control and stop this tension. It's in the first chapter. It's the 19th verse, even though that says James 3. I should have put James 1. It's, J it's the first chapter. It's the 19th verse. Look at what it says. My dear brothers and sisters, here's the prescription. Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak, and you'll be slow to get mad about stuff. In other words, if you'll stop talking about it, you'll, 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 your anger will subside. As long as you keep talking about it, you're going to get madder and madder. The more you talk, the worse it's going to get. You know, when you're digging a hole, what do they say? When you're digging yourself in a hole, quit digging. Yeah, yeah, stop digging, man. And, and, and so here's the prescription. Be quick to listen. Now, that's just the opposite of what we do. God has given us two ears and one tongue implying what? We are to listen twice as much as we talk, right? But we don't do that. We talk twice as much as we listen. We love to hear ourselves talk. We love to say things. Yeah, it's the grandest, you know, of all things. But God says, all right, if you want to keep strife and tension out of your situation, here's what you need to do. You need to be quick to listen. How do you listen to people? Whenever they're talking, do you, what are you doing while they're talking? Are, are, you, are you sitting there, you just can't wait until they take a breath so you can butt up on in there with what you want to say? I mean, you're not listening to what they're saying. You're just waiting until they quit talking to say what you want to say. You're sitting there thinking about, here's what I'm going to say whenever they get through saying whatever they're saying, because that ain't right. And, and you're not even listening to what they're saying. To listen to somebody, you have to, 
You have to pay attention. You have to look at them and, and, and stop thinking about what you want to say, even if they say wrong stuff. I mean, seriously, a lot of times when you're in strife and tension, they're going to say stuff and it's wrong. But don't stop them in the middle of what they're saying and say, you, you just as wrong as wrong can be, buddy. I know you, you know I never did say that. Hey, come here. Scott, did I come? Did I say that? Did I? No, you see, I didn't say. All right, now go ahead. Go ahead. Now, is that gonna is that listening to somebody? No, listening means you shut up here and you open up here and you listen and you you listen until they stop talking. I don't care if they do say it three or four times over and over. Listen to it. And then when they stop talking, then here's what you say. You say, okay, let me see if I got this right. Here's what I heard. Here's what I heard. Now, don't look at them and say, well, let me tell you what you just said. Because you're just pouring gas. Be diplomatic. Look at them and say, okay, uh, Here's what, I, here's what I heard. And then you restate what they just said to you. Because you will be shocked how many arguments and how much tension we have in our lives over stuff that are misunderstanding. Somebody didn't mean something that way, but that's the way you heard it. And so you're acting on what you heard. And then when you say, okay, let me tell you what I'm hearing. I'm hearing this. And they say, no, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. No, no. And see, there you go. You've, you've relieved whatever, some of that tension and stuff. And then, and then whenever you, you come to, uh, when you listen and you restate what they say, then you can strategize about what it is that you need to adjust to about what you're saying and what's going on in life. I'm just saying uh, control your words and you'll have less tension in your home. Here's number two, controlling ambition. Ambition is something that God created us with. By the way, are y'all all right? I just got... I, I got two or three more of these. Y'all going to be okay? Okay, I'm on. I'll hurry. Um, what does that mean? Uh, nothing, usually, for me. <laughs> um, controlling ambition. Uh, God builds us with ambition, and this is one of the hardest things to deal with in your life because you think it's good, and it is good. I mean, having ambition is good. To want to be something, to want to be great at it, to want to, you know, have a nice life and a great family and make some money and have a good job. And I mean, that's good. That's, that's ambition. But when you say ambition, you also have to think uh, competition. You know, you also have to think about uh, uh, jealousy. <laughs> you know, you, in other words, ambition is a wonderful sounding word, but it means lots of things. It means all of a sudden we're competing together because if I'm going to be great, that means somebody else is not going to be quite as great. So now I'm in competition with them. And then somebody else gets something I don't have. Uh Oh, well now, you know, I'm jealous, you know, whatever. And so, uh, ambition is something that you really have to, you know, put it, put it under the blood and, 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 and let God, um, uh, do something about, about the ambition in your life. He's not going to take it away because he created you with it. But, but, but what he will do is he'll bring it under control. This is what God was doing to Jacob. How many of you remember or ever hearing about a wrestling match that Jacob wrestled with an angel in the wilderness? You remember? Okay. Some of you do, some of you don't. Let me hit it real quick. Jacob uh, is by himself at night at the little creek, Jabbok. Uh, he sent his family all over to the other side. Uh, so Esau could get to them first, and, and that way it, uh, he would see all the children and kids and stuff, and he'd start feeling sorry for Jacob, and then he might not kill Jacob. So Jacob, he's crafty. He's, he's a con man. He's living off his wits. He, he's a sh- uh, high, uh, shyster uh, guy, and he stays on the other side of the creek all by himself. Well, that night he was standing by that creek, and an angel of the Lord, it was really Jesus. It was an Old Testament visitation of Jesus is what it was. Just like Daniel and the I mean, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. When, when Nebuchadnezzar looked in there, he saw Jesus walk around with him. Same thing. G- grabs him, grabs Jacob, and puts him in a wrestling hold, like a full Nelson, or, you know, a submission hold, or something. One of them. And, and Jacob is sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, Esau has got me, you know. <laughs> He's thinking, 
What? Because he can't see. It's, it's dark, and he doesn't know who it is that's grabbed him, and I'm sure he's not thinking God did it. But, and, and then he starts saying, what's your name? What's your name? And he starts trying to get loose, but he can't get loose. And he, and he just wrestles the whole night. And it says, when the, when the day started breaking, the angel looked at Jacob and said, what's your name? He said, my name is Jacob. You know what Jacob means? It means con man. It means heel grabber. It means deceiver. And when he looks at Jacob and he says, what's your name? It wasn't because he didn't know who he was wrestling with. You think that, you think that an angel's going to walk down the road just ambling by and see some you know, foreigner out there camping and says, you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to go jump on him. <laughs> you know he knew who he was wrestling with. So he wasn't asking for identification. It was his testimony. He said, who are you, man? And Jacob said, I'm a con man. I'm a liar. I'm a deceiver. I'm... That, I'm no good. That's what I am. And then when he said that, he said, all right, I'm going to bless you. And he blessed him there, and he knocked his hip out of joint. And he, in the rest of his life, he walked around with a limp. And, and when you look at him, you say, man, what happened to your hip? He said, whoo, I got blessed. And, uh, <laughs> but the point being of all of that is that God had a wrestling match with Jacob to pull the Jacob out of Jacob. Now, you have some Jacob in you too. You have some stuff in you that doesn't please God, that's not right, that's selfish and self-centered and self-serving and, and is not what God wants in you. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to wrestle with God about this. And, and he's gonna, he, what he wants to do is pull out of you that stuff that is going to cause tension and strife in your life so that you can become what he wants you to be. In other words, you know, we have a cross hanging on our wall over here. You say, what do I need to do with all of this ambition and this, you know, all this uh, pride and stuff that I have? And take it to the cross. Come to the altar and say, Lord, I need to lay this thing down out of my life. You know what I am? I, I'm somebody, I'm trying to get ahead. I'm deceitful with my family. I, I don't care about other people's opinions. I take advantage of my life full of lust. I don't know. Uh, Jesus, I'm putting it under the blood, and will you cleanse me from Put your stuff at the cross and let God have it so that you don't have to wrestle with this stuff. Because ambition, you know, you got to control that ambition because that, that, that'll, that'll put you out of bounds. And see, some children, some children never have their will broken. We're talking about breaking your will. You know, like Jesus did when he was in the garden, he said, not my will be done, but your will be done. He said that to the Father. We have a will, guys. God has to break our will. You say, what is being saved? Well, being saved, part of the essence of being saved is I wave the white flag and I surrender my will. And I say, it's not what I want anymore. It's what you want out of life. And some kids, man, they're coddled and petted and pampered and pumped up. They're told how great they are. They're given a trophy every time you turn around for nothing. We celebrate graduations from kindergarten. I mean, come on, man, you know. You know what that's teaching them? They are the center of the world. And everybody bows down to them, and everybody does what they want to do. And life's all about them. So as parents, listen, you've got to break that will because that's not going to serve them well in the future to think they're the center of the world and that everything ought to go their way and everything ought to be pampered toward them and petted toward them like mom and daddy did when they were growing up. Bless his little heart. So ambition, controlling ambition. All right, all right, you okay? All right. This is the book of James. I'm going to read this because I, I, I like you to say but if you are bitterly jealous and there, is a, and there is selfish ambition in your hearts, don't brag about being wise. That's the worst kind of lie. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and motivated by the devil. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every kind of evil. And Every 
kind of evil. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. Yield to others. What does yield mean? It means give the right away. It means pause and let them advance. When you come to a yield sign out here on the road, what does that mean? That means if something's coming, you stop, right? You let them go past. You, you stop your motion and you let them go. What is that saying to us? That is saying to us, you know how to live at peace with people? Yield yourself. Let them have the lead. I mean, let it go. Come on. It's not about you. It's not a, I mean, if you live that way, it's going to be a horrible life, but willing to yield to others. Let me, let me, can I give you just one little insight? I'm 61 years old. I have worked in the secular field a long time. I mean, I know I'm a pastor, but I do other stuff. I mean, I work for a living. <laughs> well, not implying, okay, I'm, guys, you're watching, you pastors. Not implying you don't work as a pastor. Uh, I did it for 25 years, just going to my office and, and doing sermons and studies and stuff like that and counseling with people. But it, since we've been Freedom River, I've had to work. And I've worked for two Fortune 500 companies that had to be, I had to be trained on what I do. I, had no, I did, had no idea of either job that I do that I've done. And let me tell you what I've learned working in the secular field. And I'm talking about I work with all men, probably to my advantage, nothing gets you ladies, but I, I, I work with all men. And, uh, and what I found, let me tell you what I found. What I found is if I will help them, if I will look for opportunities to be helpful to them, to yield to them in certain ways, to think about them and to try to help them advance, they will kill themselves trying to help me. I'm just telling you that it's, if you want to be blessed, you do what the Scripture says. If you will do what it says, you will be blessed and teach your children to do what it says because that's the way they're going to be blessed. Yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no partiality and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers, peacemakers, not peace lovers. Everybody loves peace. If I ask you, do you love peace? You say, yeah, I love peace. But that doesn't say peace lovers. It says peacemakers. Be ready if you start to try to make peace because you're going to get your eyes scratched out. I mean, that ought to be one of the, the, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall have their eyes scratched out. Because if you've ever tried to make peace, you found out that most of the time you become the object of their anger, both of them. And all you're trying to do is make it right. You're just trying to make peace between two people, and then both of them turn on you, right? And, and, but if you can walk away and say, well, bless the Lord, God put me in there, and I'm and I make peace, and, you know, and, and we'll just drop it and forget it, and that's all right. Let it go. Blessed, <laughs> and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. You want to reap a harvest of goodness? You say, man, I need some good stuff to happen in my life. Well, start planting some peacemaking. Yeah, I'm telling you. I promise you, if you will help other people, if you will if you will die to yourself and do things to, for the benefit of others and yield to others and humble yourself and be a peacemaker, your life will be blessed. Stuff will happen that you never even thought about happening. I mean, you will be blessed in so many ways. It is unbelievable. Your health, your life, your abilities, your, your, your future, your fortune, your family, I mean, everything will be blessed when you obey God, even when it doesn't feel good to do so. We're just talking about, you know, tension in your home. How do you get rid of it? Man, got to watch these kind of things, controlling our, our, controlling our ambitions and so forth. All right, here, controlling desires. I done got way too long. Let me just, let me just say... Uh, quickly to you, um, your desires, uh, your possessions, your, your, your material stuff. Um, let, let me just read one of the sentences in your outline I wrote for you. Everyone in the family has his own direction he wants the family to move in. 
purchases they want, vacation choices they want, eating out preferences they want, budget decisions they want. Finances and possessions are a source of some of the greatest family tension. Therefore, you can reverse the tension in your family by putting the needs of others ahead of your own. What do you want to do? What do you want to buy? What will meet your needs? Prayer is the secret to having anything you need in the family setting. God will bless you materially, and you don't have to fight to get it from someone else in your family. If someone really wants something, just let them have it. If it's, hey, if it's material, there's some more of it, right? If it's an automobile, do they make, do they make other automobiles? Well, you know, there's not just one in this world. Okay, if, if, if they just got to have it, let them have it. There's plenty of other automobiles. And God will make sure you get what you need. When you honor him, I'm not saying you serve God to get a bunch of stuff. I'm just saying he makes some promises about how our life will be if we will obey him. And this is just controlling my desires. Want what I want when I want it. I mean, no, no, no. Here's the last one. Here's some verses. Uh, James 4, what is causing quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it the whole army of evil desires that war within you? Yeah, we all got them. You want to know? Uh, you, you want what you, what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous for what others have, and you can't possess it, so you fight and you quarrel to take it away from them. And yet the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole motive is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Holy smokes. Is that a word? I could preach on that forever. All right, here we go. Last one, controlling pride. The last contributor to family tension is pride. It is the worst sin because it refuses to admit mistakes and failures. All of us fail in our families, in our words, in our wills, in our wants. Satan wants to destroy your family through tension, strife, and divorce. The secret to overcoming tension is found in humility. God gives grace to the humble you must humble yourself before God when you sin. Then resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw close to God in repentance and let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. This totally disarms the enemy and brings you back into harmony that God intended you to have in your family. Look, you need to, know, you, you need to practice this because I know you don't know how to do it. The two hardest words that you ever have to say and you got to practice them now because they got to sound natural. They have to sound like you mean it. The two hardest words you have to learn to say in a family is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The three hardest words, <laughs> I'm real sorry. I did wrong. I hurt you. I mean, these are words that pride keeps you from saying. Because you don't think you did anything wrong. And you are just so full of pride, you can't hardly walk. And it's causing tension, and it won't let tension be released in the family. More, let me read these verses, and I'm going to quit, okay? I promise you. This is in the book of James, and he gives more and more strength to stand against such evil desires. As the scriptures say, God sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. You know, that, ver that verse literally says God fights against pride. Now, let me ask you something. You want, you want God fighting against you? you uh, hey, the Apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. You know what the good fight is? The good fight is with the devil. You know why? Because you can beat him. The Holy Spirit's power in your life, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can beat him. You know what the bad fight is? The bad fight's with God because you're not going to beat God. And that verse says, when you're proud, God fights against you. I don't want God fighting against me. I, don't, I want to be on his side. But he gives favor to those who can humble themselves. So humble yourself before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I've heard people say all the time, well, what you need to do is you just need to resist the devil. If you'll just resist the devil, he'll flee from you. No, that's not what that verse says. 
That verse says, submit yourself to God. Hello? Submit yourself to God. Then you can resist the devil, and he will flee. What does submit yourself to God mean? It means I give myself to God, and I say, God, it's not about me anymore, God. It's not about my life. It's not about what I want. It's not about I'm the greatest, and I get what I want, and I get what I need. Lord, it's about you. What is it that you want? What do you desire out of my life? That is resisting the devil. Because the devil's telling you, you're the greatest, you deserve everything in life, and all the rest of them need to bow down to you. You're the most hardworking, intelligent person in the whole family, and you deserve everything, man. What's wrong with those people? So to resist him, you gotta, you got to be humble. Yeah. So submit yourself. Then number eight, draw close to God, and he'll draw close to you. Can you draw closer to God? I heard somebody say to me one time, seriously, they were really serious about this, and just listen to how this sounds. I, that verse says, draw close to God and God will draw close to you. And this person said, well, I don't, I, I don't think I can be any closer to God because um, when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came and lived on the inside of me, and so I can't really get closer than that. And I said, are you ignorant? <laughs> I mean, really? That's really supposed to be like an argument for it? Uh, listen to this. You can always draw closer to God. You know why? Because you're never as close as you think you are. And he said, if you will get close to me, I'll get close to you. And then he says this, wash your hands, you sinners. Why do you need to wash your hands? Because your hands come in contact with the world, man. It's your hand. I look, I take mm, one bath uh, every other day. No, I take, I take a bath a day whether I need it or not. All right. You know why? But I wash my hands like probably 10 times a day. You know why? Because my hands come in contact with this world. So what, what is he saying? He's saying wash, make sure the part of you that comes in contact with this old crummy, evil, polluting world stays clean. Because you can have pure motives and dirty hands. You can want to do the right thing, but you do the wrong thing. Or you can do the right thing with your hands and have an old dirty conscience and doing it for the wrong reason. See, we got to be careful Wash our hands and purify your hearts, <laughs> you hypocrites. I told you, James, what did I tell you about James? I told you to put on your steel toes. Oh, we just read a few verses out of it. It's five chapters of the whole book. Man, it's serious. Okay, so tension in the home, tension in the family. Uh, have I caused enough tension here, here today for you? Huh? I've made us all tense, haven't I? Mm -hmm. I've been up here screaming and yelling at you like some kind of mad man. Because I don't want you to have tension in your home. I just, you know, I just, I'm, I'm not mad at you or anything like that. I just get excited about stuff, certain stuff. But anyway, if you want your home to be somewhere where everybody that lives there wants to be there, get the tension out. How do you get the tension out? Obey God in all these things. Look, humility. Uh, putting others ahead of yourself. Uh, yielding to others in the family and uh, allowing, allowing them to make decisions and make choices. and allow. In other words, you can't be demanding your own way all the time and have, and have a peace in your family. You have to be careful what you say and how you say it and what you portray to others and, and your ambitions and, your, and the pride of your life and, and those kind of things. It's just a, if you'll be careful with that, then you'll have a home that can be peaceful, which everybody wants to come to. All right, stand to your feet.